Hey guys, hope you guys are all doing well. So I'm getting a lot of questions from you guys about uh, coronavirus, what it is, how we can protect ourselves from this disease, if we're going to have a summer or not this year, when are we going to be able to go out. So I thought I would make this video to kind of go over most of the questions that you guys have and hopefully be able to answer uh, these questions that you have and, your, and address some of these concerns. So let's get started. All right, so human coronaviruses have been around for a very, very long time. There's actually about seven types of human coronaviruses. So we divide coronavirus into four genuses, so which are the alpha coronaviruses, we have uh, beta coronaviruses, gamma coronaviruses, and the delta coronaviruses. So the alpha and the beta coronavirus, they, these are found in humans, whereas the gamma and the delta are found in animals. Now, uh, the thing to understand is that uh, of these four, the common ancestor for all this, it ends up being um, bats. Actually, for, for us, in, at least in, in humans, it's a, it's a bat that ends up transferring it to, to the human population. So what ends up happening is bats are the reservoirs for, um, for uh, coronaviruses. And, um, you know, they think, you know, of the bats in China, there's probably more than 5,000 strains of coronaviruses and, you know, which haven't even been identified yet. At, at this point in time, about 500 strains have been identified. Coronavirus strains have been ident identified in bats. And again, when you look at that number, 500 out of 5,000, there's a lot. So again, this is something that we need to be concerned about uh, going into the future is that, again, of all this that's out there, we don't know too much about everything else that's there. And again, the more uh, of all the strains that are out there, the, the risk, again, is when these, you know, this, uh, this reservoir animal ends up transferring it to, to humans. So usually what ends up happening is the bat ends up transmitting to another animal and that other animal we end up interacting with, and that ends up making the jump uh, to, to humans. So for both the alpha and the beta coronaviruses, this is how they end up being transmitted. So of these four, we're gonna be looking at the alpha and the beta coronaviruses. And of these, of these two groups, the ones that, uh, not, not groups, I'm sorry, of these two genus, the ones that uh, we're gonna be focusing mostly, are, mostly on are the beta coronaviruses. So in the, in the beta coronavirus, there's, there's a human coronavirus OC43, and there's another one which is, uh, that was found more recently, is the HQU1. These uh, human coronaviruses, along with the, uh, along with one, a couple from the, the alpha group, from the alpha coronavirus, which is human coronavirus NL63, along with human coronavirus 229E, they end up causing the vast majority of the common colds that we see every year. Usually it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, here we go. The, these two over here, human coronavirus OC43 and the 229E, which uh, end up making up the, the brunt of the, uh, the bulk of the, of the colds. But again, all four are involved. Now, for us in, in our times right now, what we are seeing, what we have seen are cases again, where the virus was transferred from animals to humans, and we call this zoonotic transfer. So zoonotic transfer is, again, what I had uh, explained over, that's happening over here. When you have a virus go jump from animal to human. And of these, we had SARS, which, uh, which came, right? We had SARS. Then there is also uh, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, and now, we have coronavirus too. Um, so we're going to be, of course, we're going to be talking about this in this uh, in this lecture or in this um, presentation. But none, nonetheless, these two are also uh, important players as to uh, the big picture in terms of 
coronavirus. So as you can see again, coronavirus, they're not new. They are old. They've been around for quite a time. Think about all the colds that you've had in winter for how many years you've been alive. So again, they, they're, they're not, this isn't a new disease, right? This has been going on for quite some time. So again, the high risk, these are highly transmissible. And again, the individuals that are at most for high risk transmission are animal workers. So again, which is uh, in China, when you look at it, at these wet markets, when people are interacting, when they're dealing with these live animals, they end up uh, usually possibly end up being the first ones that end up getting the virus and then from them it starts to spread. So uh, aside from that, it's healthcare workers. Um, so again, people that are in close proximity with animals and, and people that are treating these individuals that are sick have a high risk of uh, contracting and also a high risk of transmitting this disease as well to other now, as far as the comorbidities go uh, with coronaviruses, again, when you have people that are over the age of 65, people that have diabetes or high blood pressure, people that are obese, and also when you, you can look at uh, certain lifestyle factors as such as people that are smoking and uh, you know they're not exercising, they end up being uh, coming in at higher risk for contracting this, uh, and not even for coronavirus as well as you know other. Um, pathologies as well, other pathogens. So let's move along to the next slide. So let's talk about the, the group B coronaviruses. And uh, in particular, we're going to be looking at uh, SARS, MERS, and again, COVID-19. So again, as I said before, these pathogens are zoonotic. Okay, or again, these are animal diseases that are transferred, they're, tr they're transmissible to humans. So again, with, uh, with SARS back in, uh, in 2002, what we had is, you know, we went from a, from a bat that mutated and it ended up coming into contact with this civet cat. And from the civet cat, it, it ended up coming to humans. And um, for, for this, you know, in terms of, um, it's uh, in terms of case fatality, Okay, so in other words, of all the people that were known, that, are, that have been documented to have come into contact or to have contracted SARS, to, uh, SARS, 800 of them died. So when you do the math, that gives you about a 10% uh, case of fatality. Then we move on 10 years. 10 years down the line, then we end up having uh, MERS or uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And in MERS, what we found is, again, it went from a bat to um, a dromedary camel. And from the dromedary camel, it came on to, to humans. And uh, it was identified in, uh, whereas the, the uh, SARS was first found in, in China, um, MERS ended up being first identified in, uh, in the U United Arab Emirates. So again, hence the term Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Um, and uh, what we found for this is that it had a much higher case fatality. For MERS, of the documented, okay, 2,500 cases, 850 individuals died. That gave us a case fatality of 34%. Now, moving on to COVID-19, okay, or SARS-2. Again, we found that this virus went from a, a, a bat, and not to a camel, this is an error, but it actually went from a bat to what uh, this animal is. This is called a panglion. And from the panglion, it came to a human. Now again, this is a possibility. We're not really sure yet at this point, but this is the, the thought of this. this, this panglion, this is kind of like an, um, it's got a sticky tongue, but what's unique about it is are the scales that it has. And um, a lot of people in the, in the, in the East, um, they use this medicinally. They think it has some, some healing properties, which, which they use that for. And then also the meat is, uh, it's, uh, it's a delicacy over there. So it, uh, actually it sells, uh, it's, it's quite expensive. It's about $300 a pound. 
for um, for for this animal uh, to to consume. So again, it's it's used for both its medicinal properties as well as for the again just for consumption, human consumption for food. Um, so again, this was also also thought to be transmitted from possibly at a wet market. Now let's talk about case fatality. So to date, up to date, by the, you know at the time this video was uh, being produced. The data shows 1,795,819 in people that have been documented with coronavirus 2. Of that, 109,933 have died or succumbed to this disease. That gives us a case fatality of 6.1%. However, again, 6.1% compared to 10% over here, compared to 34% over here, seems rather small. But when you look at the number of people that died, it's still quite a bit. Again, 109,000 people that are dead, 850 people in 800. This is a very big number. So one of the reasons why this is still low and you know this number is high, well, one of the, the, the problems for that is because uh, this thing is still going around, whereas uh, SARS-2, pretty much it's come to an end. Uh, MERS, it's, there's still some cases, it hasn't completely been stopped. MERS is still floating around uh, in the population, but again, it's um, under very it's under control. Why? Because again, in both cases, they're able to identify what the, the the reservoir was. Whereas one of the reasons for COVID is still there hasn't been a definitive identification of this host reservoir, which humans ended up getting it from. So. Um, aside from that, we're going to be talking about why this number is so high as well as we progress through. So the other thing, the next thing that we want to look at is how bad is this? How transmissible is this COVID-19? So one of the things that we want to look at when we compare co uh, coronavirus to your seasonal flu, your influenza, is this first part over here, which is called the, the r naught. So COVID has an r naught of about 3, whereas influenza had it about almost about 1, 1.3. Now, what does this mean? This means for every one person that's that's there, every person transmits to three other individuals. Whereas when you look at it over here, you go from one person to another person, this person transfers to another one, and this one will transfer to another one, and so on and so on. So now you look over here, we got from one to three, and this individual is gonna go and transfer to three more, and this is gonna transfer to three more, and this one will also transfer to three more. So when you start to look at it, this is highly exponential. So if you look at the curve, you know, it goes up like this, whereas when you look at the r naught for, for the flu, it tends to kind of stay more linear. So this is the one of the differences between the two. This is why this is so contagious. For every one person, they're spreading to, th to three other individuals. Now, the other thing that we want to look at is this figure over here, this SI that you see. So when you look at this over here, this SI or the series interval, essentially to explain this to you, let's say we have two patients, patient one and patient, patient two. So let's say the the symptom start date for patient actually here, for patient one is right over here. Okay, so this is day zero. And let's say it goes for about oh say twenty-three days, right? And it stops over there. Then let's just make some points over here. This is maybe day two over here, day four, six, eight. 10, 12, and this is not going to be to scale, but let's just say this is about day 23 over here. Then we got patient 2 over here. And let's say for patient 2, the symptoms start right about this point, which is about day number 6 over here. And again, his will continue to day 23 also. All right? So what we essentially have is this. So from this point over here, to this point, we have six 
days. Okay, so from the time of symptoms onset for patient one, patient one to the time of symptom onset for patient two. So for this is what this this uh, series interval essentially is. So the SI for coronavirus it tends to be about anywhere from oh about five about five to maybe seven seven and a half days or so so this is a series interval for that when you compare that to the flu the flu actually it's it's a, it's a little bit worse for the flu the series interval tends to be about two and a half so flu is um again this when you, in terms of spreadability the flu the flu is much a little bit more severe compared to uh, in, in terms of the series interval compared to uh, coronavirus, which is about, let's just go with the, the, the higher number, what's seven and a half days. So when you look at the, essentially what, what they're saying is this, um, in terms of this. So the the smaller this, this number is going to be, the SI number, the smaller it is, the more worse it is, okay? And the, the larger it is, the less dangerous it's going to be. So we want the series interval, this to be the bigger, it's, it's better for us. Uh, where, where it's, when it's smaller, it's going to be, it's going to be spreading much, 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 uh, the, the virus is going to be much more dangerous. So again, uh, it'll move faster. That's what, that what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to explain by this SI. Now, the other thing, so we look, we looked at this, uh, the R naught, we looked at the, the uh, serious interval. And one other thing that you wanna, that we wanna look at is from the point that you get the infection to the time that you actually develop symptoms, what is that duration, okay? How long could it be after, let's say, for example, you're walking down, you come into contact with the coronavirus and you end up contracting it, the virus enters your system. So once it enters your sy uh, system to the point that you start to actually display the symptoms. What's the time period for that? So this number again is um, it's it's questionable. So we say that it could be up to twenty three days, possibly. Okay, some studies have shown up to twenty three days. Other studies, you know, maybe perhaps about seven days that they're looking at, um, or again, it could be perhaps within ten days. That, that they show up, or it could be 14. So the, the, the thing to understand is that it's slow. This virus, once it comes in, in inside you, it takes a long time for, even if it's seven days, it takes a long time for these symptoms to develop. What does that mean? That means that, that doesn't mean, you know, you're still contagious after you get that virus. You're still contagious. So even though you do not display any symptoms for, let's just say, seven days or 10 days, and you cough or, and you sneeze, you're still transmitting the viruses to other people, okay? And every, up to three people. And again, in these individuals, perhaps in some of them, they may not see any symptoms until 14 days. Others may see it at, at seven days. So this is the other problem. So when you, when you consider all these three factors, uh, for coronavirus, it's one of the reasons why it's transmitting rather rapidly. Again, some people will have it for, uh, they may not show any symptoms for about 14 days, okay? Once they do show symptoms, let's just say about seven days, then perhaps it'll take, uh, and they start to transmit it. It, it, it won't be another seven and a half days till the next person shows, develops uh, symptoms for it. Again, this is a good thing for coronavirus that it that it's large. Now, if it were you know two and a half, that would be you know that would be pretty bad. But um, so we have something of, of a positive nature in that, in that sense that this is a little bit you know this is a large larger number. However, again, this is still pretty you know three an R naught of three. It's it's not good you know because as I showed you before, we have an exponential growth. You're spreading it to three other people uh, every time. Uh, for, from one individual to, to three individuals. So with that said, um, we now can, you, got, you can understand a little bit as to the, the severity of this uh, disease and how, one of the reasons why it's 
kind of gone out of control is that it is spread very easily and the other thing is, is that when we you know how long does it actually take for the symptoms to first appear uh, is quite, after you contract it is actually quite some time you know there's a a, a seven to is a you know a one to three week window after you contract the virus to where you start to develop the symptoms so and again if you don't develop symptoms you don't think you're sick you're not going to stay at home you're going to go out and about you're going to do your you're, you're going to live your life normally so this is another issue for why this disease has been spreading so fast. Compare that to the flu, you get sick after a couple of days, you know, symptoms pop up, maybe three days later, you're gonna be home. In this case, you're not, you're still going out and about, you're spreading this. How does coronavirus get transmitted? So there's a couple of different ways. One of them is through the fecal oral route, and then the others are, is through respiratory droplets. So let's look at this one first, in terms of fecal route. So what do we have? We have feces, and then Let's say somebody goes to the bathroom, they, they go number two, and then they do not wash their hands properly. Then they go outside and they start touching things. They can touch um, the, the doorknob, for example, and from there, you know, they go out, they touch money, they buy things, and they touch the door of opening a refrigerator at a grocery store, et cetera, et cetera. And again, you can get the idea of how things transmit fr from there. So again, from there, it could even go to, you, know, you take your dirty hands, you touch it to food, food goes into the mouth. Now you've just introduced this virus into your body. Other times, is again, flies or, uh, and other insects, they may go on to the feces, get infected, and then they carry it over to food or, it's extremely rare, uh, but yeah, let's just say it this way, they'll end up coming to, to food. Or again, Feces through another means, um, you're outside, you're out and about. And again, most of the time what ends up happening is through either through um, out in the environment or even in, in water, uh, infected feces, you could come into contact with that. Both, perhaps, you might be outside of the park playing around, you, you may end up stepping on feces. And then from there again, you end up transmitting to other, uh, other places, other locations, and again, both flies or, or, again, through contact, human contact, direct contact, uh, with that ends up coming into your system. Or again, same thing could happen through water. Infected water ends up coming into contact with, with food or you end up drinking it somehow. So this is one route in terms of fecal oral route. Feces could be introduced and uh, could be spread by, again, directly by our hands, through water sources or again, through other vectors, such as a fly. In terms of respiratory droplets now, so respiratory droplets essentially is when you cough or when you, you sneeze, this mist of particles that comes out uh, that you sneeze out from, or again, when you cough out, they end up having, uh, they end, it, 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 this mist, okay, this aerosol, ends up containing um, virus particles as well, or it, it contains pathogens as well. And again, from there it spreads. So how far will it spread for coronavirus? Again, this is, they're saying perhaps up to six feet, all right? This is what they're saying. Uh, perhaps it could be three feet as well. So and we're talking about anywhere from one to two meters uh, that you know the, these virus particles could, could travel for. Now, the other debate is how long can it survive in the air? A few minutes or a few hours. So this is the other thing. Some people, there's some researchers that are saying that up to two to three hours that the, the virus could survive in the air of a, a confined area of a room. So uh, this is something else to think about uh, when you're going inside. And again, in, in, again, the, 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 the data, it's... It's too new and it's not scrutinized properly at this point. There's not enough multiple experiments, not, not enough um, people are not reproducing it enough to, to, to get a, a good variation in, in the data to see how similar the reports are coming from uh, one person doing it to another person doing it. But again, um, early reports, uh, early studies are, are showing that it could be anywhere from two to three days, uh, two to three hours in terms of uh, the, this virus surviving in the air. 
Uh, aside from that, there's other things also which we're going to be looking at as we go down, as we uh, progress through. So uh, of that, in terms of surface transmission, so different surfaces, they have the ability to transmit the pathogen with different degrees. Before that, let me come back over here. The other thing that, you, uh, that, uh, that we should consider in terms of respiratory droplets is temperature, okay? Temperature and humidity. So generally speaking, the lower the temperature and higher the humidity, the, it's that uh, these two conditions are much more favorable for the pathogen. So they like the, for this virus. So it likes cooler temperatures, and it likes uh, higher humidities, um, because it's the, the the membrane that the the coronavirus is surrounded by. It's rather the the the, the fat particles, the lipids, they, they dry up rather relatively quickly if it's not humid enough. So again, the humidity helps it uh, quite a bit. It helps it uh, survive much longer. So if we have, for example, temperatures that are less than, oh, I don't know, perhaps 18 degrees centigrade, okay, less than 18 degrees centigrade. So we're talking about less than 65 Fahrenheit roughly or so, 60, yeah, around that, around this range. This is enough for it. Even up to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, it, the, the virus can survive. Now, um, humidity, the higher the humidity, so if you have 60%, 70% humidity, it's loving it, it likes it even much better. At that point, the temperature is not as critical as the, the humidity uh, would be. If the humidity is still there, then the temperature is it's not that much of a variable for it. Yes, still higher temperatures will end up destroying it, but again, we're not talking about extreme temperatures. Again, we're talking about environmental temperatures that we find uh, in, in a room. Uh, so again, in, in any given room, the temperature varies anywhere from 18 to 22 degrees. And again, the virus can survive at these temperatures uh, relatively easy. So um, cooler than this, they'll survive. Important thing is humidity for it also. So the higher the humidity, it, it's gonna survive. So let's start talking about uh, different uh, the surface types. As for surface uh, transmission, what we have seen is that um, in terms of paper, for example, tissue paper, print paper, it can survive up to about three hours. So three hours for papers. Um, now, when you come to print paper, you know, so let's put this on print paper. When it comes to wood and your clothes, so fabric, okay, uh, it can last up to, believe it or not, two days. Okay, two days on clothes and, and wood, cloth fabric and wood. However, when you start looking at glass and um, paper money, glass and paper money, it will last for up to four days, one of the studies has found. When it comes to steel, so we're looking at steel, stainless steel and plastics, they showed the longest survivability for, for the uh, virus. So poly, uh, <clears throat> polyproline, plastics, and stainless steel, up to seven days, they found the virus to be able to survive on the surface. In addition to that, surprisingly, when, you, when they looked at the, the outer surface of surgical masks that our uh, healthcare professionals are, are wearing, and now even you know um, citizens are using, they also found it to be for seven days. So the outside layer of the surgical mask, seven days. Stainless steel, plastic, seven days. Paper money and glass, four days. Cloth, two days. Print paper, three days. So again, this virus can survive for quite a bit. And you know, we talked about how long it can survive in the air and we said up to three days. Uh, I'm sorry, up to three hours for, uh, three hours for, uh, for to tr um, survive in air. So uh, these things, you know, they're, this is one of the reasons why you need to be washing your hand and not touching your mouth, nose, and, and uh, around your eyes. So again, don't touch your face. Wash your hand frequently. 
because this virus can survive for quite a bit of time. And remember, the other thing we, we talked about are temperatures. So uh, it likes humid humidity. So again, 65% humidity, uh, it's, it's good for it. Even 40% humidity, it can survive. Not as good. At 40% uh, humidity, it wants lower temperatures. So it wants temperatures less than 70 degrees, less than uh, 68, 65 degrees, it's better. For the higher temperatures, if it's 65% and, and humidity, it can survive, you know, greater than 71 degrees Fahrenheit. So, um, you know, uh, at this point, it, it that this humidity helps make up for the low temperature. So, what does that mean? You know, we're in spring, we're going into summer. Are we safe in the summertime? Well, not really. I mean, uh, in terms that, yes, the warmer weather is, is not favorable for this, virus in most parts of the world uh you know except there's exceptions of course but you know there's still a good amount of humidity that's there and as long as there's humidity and also people that are using climate control then that virus is going to be able to survive uh, even in in, uh, in the warmer months so uh with that said um again wash your hands keep the your work area is clean wipe them down every so often so the thing is you know in terms of a uh, surface transmission when you look at this in terms of um, cloth versus you know you think that why is you know something close why is it not as high as as a uh, as glass or steel so they found that the virus likes smooth surfaces when there are smooth surfaces the virus can you know it can spread easier so when you look at cloth because cloth cloth is not completely flat there's still you know uh depressions within the cloth and if the virus particles kind of get into these depressed areas they can't they're kind of trapped over there so they can't spread as easily and again that's so that's a good thing it's a benefit about or in, in terms of that uh, but then again at the same time it survives for much much longer uh, than it does on, on print or paper for that matter. In terms of pets and coronavirus, are we able to transmit this to our pets or can our pets get it from us? So to answer that question, first of all, the fear is that, you know, you're going to get sick from your pet. Your pet's going to end up giving it to you. Well, chances are most likely you're going to end up giving it to your pet and your pet is going to be able to give it to you. So there is, there are only actually two cases. So, so far only two cats and two dogs that have been diagnosed with coronavirus. And most likely they ended up getting the coronavirus through their owners. Why? Because again, cats and dogs, they'll go up and they'll start licking your face. Well, this is how you end up getting this thing. So again, this is why we say do not touch your don't touch your face, don't rub your eyes, don't rub your nose. And these animals, they go right for our most uh, intimate and vulnerable part of our body. So we end up giving it to them. And now if they go and start, again, kissing, or again, their fluids drop on other parts of the, uh, on the surface of your home. So for example, a cat comes and, and licks you then goes and, I don't know, all of a sudden has a runny nose or starts to drool, as in the case a dog would do, onto the surface of a table. You go, you touch that table, and then you rub your eyes and face with it. Then you end up getting it, or somebody else. If you have a visitor, then they would end up getting it. So, there is a possibility for that. However, again, you're going to end up getting your, your, your pet sick. So, do not worry about that. Um, so if you're sick with, co if you have coronavirus, don't get rid of your, your pets. So easiest thing to do is, again, don't lock them outside of the house. Don't let them loose. Um, that's just being ridiculous and being cruel. So be kind to your animals. Um, again, you want to isolate yourself from, from your pets as well. Um, first things first, wash your hands. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Keep sanitizing your hands. Do not let your pets lick your face. Okay, don't let them lick your, your hands either or your masks. Don't kiss your pets. If you want to touch your pet, then make sure you wash your hands before you touch them. After you touch them, wash your hands again. 
Um, same thing when you're feeding them, wash your hands beforehand. Uh, masks, again, as I showed you in the, in the previous uh, slide, up to seven days, the virus can survive on the mask. So change it regularly. Do not wear the same mask for a week. Do not wear, wear it for the same day. Again, if you're going to be at work, throw it away when you leave work and then put on another mask. And, you know, if you're, especially for, tra if you're uh, moving through, if you're utilizing public transportation, at that point, definitely you want to get rid of it before you walk into your house. If you, when you walk into your house, make sure there's a separate mask for that. Keep that. You don't want to bring whatever's outside that you have caught inside the house, especially where there's pets present. And again, pets are very curious. They want to go and sniff. This is how they explore their environment, through smell. So again, don't share that mask from the outside uh, with you know, your confined friend. Um, also, the other thing is, you know, as you're eating or drinking food, don't, do not share that with your pets. Do not give them food that you're eating. Again, you are sick. Do not, you wouldn't do that with your child, so do not do that with your friend. Hopefully you would not do that with your child or your loved one, for that matter. So again, there isn't a, there's no evidence that says that pets are a source for coronavirus. So again, don't abandon them. Now, in terms of uh, the virus and summertime, so again, what's going to happen this summer? Are you guys going to have a normal summer? Will you be going to the beach? Will you be going to amusement parks and concerts, et cetera, et cetera? Well, time will tell, but uh, in, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, I think it is best to continue to practice isolation, the social distancing uh, measures to reduce the, again, the further spread of this virus. So definitely, I don't recommend going into crowded environments of any type, such as concerts or, or um, baseball games or, or whatever sporting event that will end up coming about. Not a good idea to come into any such close proximity uh, with, uh, with others, with, with uh, individuals who may be carriers of the virus. Uh, and again, they could spread it on to yourself. And that could become problematic for you, especially if you're if you have underlying conditions, comor comorbidities that we discussed already earlier. So with that and beach. So one of the problems with beach, when you talk about that, there's a lot of aeros uh, aerosolization that's taking place over there. As the waves are coming, there's vapors that are being created. People are starting to sneeze. They're breathing. What's going to end up happening? Some of those virus particles, they'll get trapped into that air and then as the wind comes it blows and now it's spreading so this is one of the concerns for um, for beach again for going to the, the beach so again you know rain you know the, one of the, the the major source the main source for rain it comes from as the water evaporates from the oceans and the seas and the lakes this is how we end up getting uh, the Great Lakes I should say you know this is how we end up getting uh, our uh, uh, rain that starts again okay, again the clouds they form by this vaporization that takes place evaporation so we need to consider this uh, keep this in mind when you're going to the beach so again i don't recommend to do that if you do make sure you go to beaches that are not crowded and there's a lot of space you can perhaps go early in the morning when there's not too many people there when there's nobody there or again uh, close to the evening time and try to stay away from people uh, so again, th this is something to consider. So unfortunately, summer may not be as fun as it has been in, in previous years. Let's take a closer look at the structures that make up the respiratory system. So it starts off with our mouth and nose, and from there it goes to our throat and down to the windpipe. And the windpipe then divides into two smaller tubes that go into each one of the lungs. And these smaller tubes divide into even smaller tubes until it finally gets to, it, it branches off into different levels. So from this large tube, you have two smaller tubes, and each one of these smaller tubes divides into smaller ones. And then from there, it becomes smaller and smaller until you finally get to these very tiny, uh, the tiniest of these tubes, which are called the terminal bronchioles, which connect to these structures called the alveoli. And for coronavirus, this is where the problem starts. So what ends up happening is in these alveoli, there's two main type of cells that we find. 
that make them up. They are the type 1 cells and the type 2 alveolar cells. So the type 2 cells produce a substance, a chemical called surfactant. And surfactant, it decreases the surface tension. The other type of cell are the type 1 cells. Now the type 1 cell is what allows for the exchange of the gases between this alveoli and the blood vessels that are on the other side of it. So if those cells are being attacked and eventually they end up getting damaged, then that's going to cause a problem in terms of the gas exchange to take place, in addition to a lot of other, you know, other issues which we'll be looking at. So this is what we're, we're going to be looking at uh, in the next, um, probably in the next few slides as to what transpires, how does this virus end up attacking these type 1 uh, cells that make up the, the alveoli. All right, let's take a closer look at this uh, coronavirus particle. So this particle, this virus, viral particle, is said to be pleomorphic, meaning that it doesn't have a defined structure or a shape. It's about 125 nanometers in diameter, and its, uh, it's genome is quite huge. It's 30 kilobases, and again, for, a vi for an RNA virus, it's, it's, it's quite big, it's huge. And it could be, this genome can be directly read by the ribosome in the host cell. Uh, because it is of the positive sense, it's a positive sense RNA. Uh, aside from that, this particle also is this uh, the genome. It is uh, coated with a protein that's called a nucleocapsid protein. Let's put that down. Nucleocapsid protein. So that you will find surrounding the the, the RNA, and again, it forms this helical nucleocapsid. The lipid envelope, it's derived from the, the host cell. And aside from that, what we find is this, this nuclear, this lipid envelope, it's lined with these transmembrane proteins. The, mo the most prominent of these transmembrane proteins would be this spike protein or the S protein. And this is essentially what gives us this crown-like shape, uh, this uh, the spike protein. Aside from that, we also have these matrix proteins. And these the matrix protein, it's a, again, it's a, member, a membrane glycoprotein. And it's a, the next most abundant after the spike protein that we find. And um, it, 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 it's believed that this, it connects the, the membrane to the nucleocapsid. Um, and again, it may play a role in the morphogenesis phase of the viral uh, life cycle. Again, they're still studying this, so we're, we're going to be, hopefully, we'll learn more about uh, these proteins and, and what roles they have. And then finally, we have this, uh, which we find much, much less of, the, this E protein, or the, uh, the envelope protein. And um, so these are the three main types. We have the spike protein, the, the matrix protein, and then the, the envelope protein. So what we have over here is we're looking at this the spike protein and this is what the virologists have been able to determine at this point of what the structure actually looks like at a molecular level. So what we see is that it, it consists of a, this, uh, we have this upper part and the lower part. In other words, this upper domain this is a globular domain, and this is where uh, this is also the receptor binding domain. And as the the lower part, this is the fusion do, the fusion domain, or again, this is the pr the, the the process of the uh, the fusion machinery. And uh, within it, where we have this the fusion machinery, we have these fusion peptides which are which are hydrophobic, and these pep these hydrophobic peptides are tucked into this fusion machinery. So it's, again, this is a very conserved process. Uh, compare that to up over here again. This is where you're gonna ha where we find these, the human angiotensin converting enzyme two uh, binding sites over here. And uh, so this is this part up over here is what it's what's going to be interacting with the cells of our uh, of our body, our type two cells that we have in, in our lungs. The and on these type two cells, we have these uh, receptors that which we will be talking about, which are angiotensin converting enzyme uh, receptors. And this is where what 
these sites are able to recognize and bind to. So let's talk about what happens in terms of uh, this virus binding with the our lung cells. So again, this coronavirus, once it comes into our respiratory system, it goes and it's able to attach to our type 1 cells. And it specifically recognizes these angiotensin converting enzyme 2, these ACE2 receptors that are found on the type 1 cells. And this is where the problem will start to move, you know, it starts to progress at this point. So that spike protein, it recognizes and it binds to this ACE2 receptor. Okay, however, that's not enough for the RNA to, to come inside the cell. So what, what, what ends up happening next is that we have these proteolytic cleavage enzymes uh, that end up being, um, being released. And it, that gets done by these other type of cells, uh, these receptors that are found on the host cell, which, are, which is the, the TMPRSS2. And TMPRSS2, what it will do is that it's going to, it's going to cleave the, the, this, the spike protein. So remember we had different, uh, different we had the upper domain and the, the lower domain. And the upper domain, remember we said, this is what actually binds to the receptor cell. So this, the TMPRSS2, ends up working with the, the, lower, the, uh, the lower domain. Uh, in that, again, it's gonna be, um, uh, it's gonna make changes and it's gonna start de separating the, the, fusion domain, uh, the fusion machinery, the fusion domain. So, and these events that, um, that transpire it, allow, it activates the fusogenic state of the protein, which, again, subsequently, it's going to allow for entry of the RNA and this uh, into the host cell. And this may occur directly at the plasma membrane, or it may occur upon endocytosis, or perhaps it may end up uh, occurring uh, both ways. Again, that part is still not very well understood. So again, to recap, what do we have here, first thing? We have the, the virus particle, it comes into proximity to a type 1 alveolar cell where it ends up being recognized and it binds to a ACE2 receptor. Okay, it, Once the ACE2 receptor binds, remember this happens with the upper domain of the spike protein. Next, TMPRSS2 ends up cleaving the, the lower domain and then it, around, it allows for this fusion machinery to start working. Um, at that point, then we end up getting either, well, we end up getting the RNA entering the the host cell again. This is where the infection takes place. So now we're inside the host cell. So what's going to happen at this point? So now, since this RNA is inside the cell, you know, just imagine this is kind of extend this as to being our cell. Um, what's going to end up happening at this point is that this RNA is going to go and attach itself directly to a ribosome. And it's going to start to get red. Remember, this is a it's a it's a positive sense uh, RNA. Okay, so it that's all it needs is that uh, it just needs a ribosome. So now the machine. So here, let's just make a imagine this is a ribosome, and here's our RNA. Now it's going to start to get red. Okay. Now as this is happening, it's going to be starting. It will start producing the viral proteins, the viral viral particles, but. The other thing that, that, that could happen, the other thing that, that's also happening is that RNA dependent RNA polymerase will start making copies of this RNA, uh, RNA particle as well. Okay, So we have two things that are going on at this point. We have this ribosome that's producing copies of the different viral, viral particle, translation is taking place. Aside from these uh, polyproteins that are being produced, these viral proteins that are being produced, the viral particle is also being copied itself. So now we have multiple copies of this RNA, okay, that is being produced. And in addition to that, we have different types of viral pro particles, viral proteins that are also being Made. So some of these might be the, the, these, uh, the, the S protein, there could be the M protein, the matrix protein, or the E protein. So all these different components are also being produced 
inside the the host cell okay this is our healthy cell remember our healthy cell has been hijacked by this viral particle and it's not doing what it needs to do instead now instead of doing its job it is now just enslaved to this rna and it's just producing all the different part of the the components for the virus so this process will continue uh, until all the resources are used up and then again until a point where uh, the cell just it dies you know it will more or less the, the envelope this membrane it falls apart and then what ends up happening is uh, well you know since we have all this RNA and we have all these components they will end up being assembled into other coronavirus particles and then all as a, the the host cells nuclear membrane opens up or through exocytosis additional viral particles will now go into circulation and these viral particles then will go and infect other host cells other healthy cells and on and on and on and on so this is where things start to become bad i guess you know if, if, when you want to look at it so now we're going to be talking about all right fine we have our cells that are invaded our host cells have been hijacked by this RNA and it's producing all this RNA uh, uh, particles, the viral particles, and again, it's allowing uh, the virus to replicate. And now the virus is starting to spread. What does our body do? So let's take a look at that now. All right, so our cells have now been infected by the coronavirus and it's starting to produce copies of itself and our cells, they start to, they start to die. So what ends up happening is, as our cells are being attacked and they start to become damaged, these damaged cells, so remember we're talking about these type 1 cells which are being invaded, okay? Um, they will start secreting inflammatory mediators which end up going recruiting macrophages. And remember, macrophages are a type of white blood cell that comes in and helps us when, we're, when our body's being attacked, when our body's hurt. So macrophages, they start to secrete cytokines and the cytokines then will start to recruit um, interleukin-1, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and also two, uh, tumor necrosis fa factor alpha. So these in turn end up having physiological effects. Well, so what are these physiological effects? Well, we're going to be looking at this area over here. Remember, the cells that are being damaged over here, these are the cells that are being damaged, these type 1 cells. Um, so what's going to be taking place over there? So when interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor, tumor necrosis factor alpha, when they start to, when they start being recruited, they will cause the blood vessels to dilate. So now we have vasodilation. Vasodilation, what that will do, okay, it's going to increase the capillaries permeability. Remember, this is all, this is a pulmonary capillary over here. So it's going to increase the capillary permeability. Now remember, between this capillary and the alveolar uh, cells, we have, we have an interstitial, interstitial space, right? There's a, there's a space over there. So as that, the, the, um, this blood vessel becomes more permeable, now we have more fluid that's seeping out. So as that fluid is starting to seep out, more fluid is starting to build up between the blood vessel and the, um, the, the, uh, the alveoli. Now we're starting to get an increase of, of pressure that's starting to build up, right? So what's, that, what's the problem with that? Well, now it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect how much this sac is able to blow up, how, how much it's going to be able to inflate. So remember, the more pressure that is that's being pushed from, let me change the color over here. So the more pressure that's being applied on, well, here, this is not good either. Let me try this. The more pressure that's coming over here, it's, it's going to become harder for these, for this space to, to get, uh, to fill up with air, okay? Why? Because again, this has become more permeable because of these guys over here, which were recruited from because the type 1 cells are damaged. 
So now as there's more fluid over here, it becomes more difficult for air to enter the space, okay? And so this is one of the problems, right? Next thing that's gonna happen is that some of this fluid, okay, some of the plasma, so remember when we said that the permeability increased, the capillary permeability, some of that fluid went over here, right, within the space. Now, eventually, it's gonna end up coming inside this, into the alveoli as well. So, the plasma is gonna to start to fill up on the outside of the alveoli, and then sub subsequently, it's gonna to start to enter the alveoli. Now we end up having alveolar edema, okay? So what ends up happening? Now, that's gonna affect the amount of surfactant that we have over there as well, right? We are the type two cells, they're producing surfactant, but now the surfactant is being mixed up with the with the uh, the plasma. So the remember, and what surfactant do, and does surfactant? Remember, th this is produced by the type two cells in surfactant. It decreases the surface tension. So now, because we have the blood plasma that's mixed with the surfactant, the surfactant is not going to be as effective. So in return, now we're going to end up having another problem our surface tension will start to increase, okay? So increase of surface tension. That's another issue that's gonna happen. So we ended up having what? Our alveolar, we had uh, too much permeability. That was, <clears throat> excuse me, that was one of the problems that we had. We had more pressure that's coming from the outside. Now we're having, we're having fluid that's, that plasma that's filling up within the alveoli. That's another problem. And this third issue that we said is this surface tension has increased. So, what's gonna end up happening then? Surface tension increases, the alveoli, if it, it's gonna collapse, right? So we have alveolar collapse at that point. So, when the alveoli collapse, what's gonna end up happening? Well, now you have to start breathing much harder, okay? So, uh, your work that we have to do, work, of breathing will increase. Now you're starting to breathe much harder, okay? Labored breathing. Along with this, gas exchange decreases as well. All right, so now we have decreased gas exchange. What is this? Well, this is now leading to hypoxemia. Okay, this, what ends up happening? Now we end up having what we call acute respiratory distress syndrome. Right, this starts to, to ensue. So again, our blood gases have been altered. We have, we, we're having to breathe much more with a lot more labor. So again, we're using up a lot more energy to breathe. Um, the amount of gases that are in the blood have also decreased, okay, hypoxemia. So uh, this is when things are starting to get pretty, pretty bad. Now, while all this is happening, you have to keep in mind, there's still a fight going on, okay? So other so macrophages are, are they're, they're coming and they're trying to kill some of these viral particles. Along with that, we also have other cells that are coming. Um, and remember, our, the type one cells are dying also. So not only the type one cells that are dying, but type two cells that are also being destroyed, they're dying as well. So these neutrophils, are also being recruited. When the macrophages come, and when the cytokines are, are released, the cytokines not only um, recruit these interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor, but they also end up recruiting neutrophils. So again, neutrophils, they'll come and they'll try to destroy the, the virus by releasing these, what's called, uh, it's called re reactive oxygen species. So, and aside from that, proteases as well. So when they end up doing this, again, it ends up damaging, unfortunately, one of the, you know, the, how do you, what do you call it, another way to look at this, uh, one of the casualties that end, end up resulting from all this fighting, and again, just the virus taking over, is, you know, we end up having death of both type one and type two cells. So now, as we have these dead, healthy cells, and also, Hopefully, we end up having the viral particles that are also being destroyed. We end up having a lot of fluid that's present. Okay, so we have fluid that's present inside over here, inside this area. 
inside the alveoli. Okay, so this is starting to get filled up with fluid. Aside from fluid, we have cell debris. There's macrophages, neutrophils. So what that, that's doing is it's compacting this, this, this area, this tiny little um, sac, and we're getting consolidation that's, that's occurring. And again, this con uh, consolidation that occurs, it ends up further altering the gas exchange. So again, it's just gonna, it's gonna intensify, it's gonna make the hypoxemia worse. It increases the hypoxemia, which again, which in return, again, it ends up resulting in more symptoms of uh, acute, acute, it further contributes to acute respiratory distress syndrome. So this is where physiologically the problem is occurring, what takes place when coronavirus starts to take over our healthy cells and our immune system responds. This is the, the battle that's taking place. So now that we've spoken, we've talked about what's happening, what the battle is looking like as it's taking place, what are some of the signs and the symptoms that we will experience when we are infected? Now, keep in mind that what I'm about to tell you in terms of signs and symptoms, not everybody gets. It varies from one person to the next people. And as we said before, you know, at the start of the lecture, people that are more, that have underlying um, medical issues, comorbidities such as um, high blood pressure, people that have diabetes, people that are obese, people that smoke, um, again, lifestyle factors such as smoking uh, and other recreational drug abuse, they will probably, they're gonna be at a higher risk for uh, their conditions worsening and they may display uh, symptoms that are more prevalent than in other individuals, possibly in healthier uh, individuals. They may not exhibit some of these symptoms. Again, sometimes, again, you, it's, it just varies so much. You see athletes that end up dying from this, from coronavirus, and other times you see you know, 90 year olds that end up walking out of the emergency, uh, out of the hospital, out of the intensive care unit uh, after they're being treated with it. So again, um, it, uh, it varies from person to person, but again, having comorbidities, it does increase the likelihood and severity of some of the signs and symptoms. So let's talk about some of the things that may happen. So one of the things that could happen is that you may end up with a fever, okay? So fever could be one of the things. It ends up, for a lot of people, they end up having to work to, to breathe, um, labored breathing. So again, uh, the work of, of breathing will also increase, okay? So it's uh, harder to breathe, harder to breathe, okay? Um, in addition to that, Another symptom that many, some people have is coughing. Okay, so you may you may have a cough, and again, it's it could be a productive cough. In other individuals, it's a dry cough. Um, along with that, what do you end up having? You got you, you have uh, you're coughing. Perhaps it's productive, uh, meaning again you have mucus. You have a lot of fluids that are in your lung, and hopefully you're able to remove it from the lungs. You're able to cough it out. But you know, again, a lot of times you can, that doesn't happen. So what ends up happening is you have difficulty breathing. So again, there's dyspnea. Uh, and along with that, you end up seeing shortness of breath that comes along with it. Uh, so what do we have? Shortness of breath. Shortness of breath, there we go. Uh, in addition to that, the amount of oxygen that we have in our body also starts to decrease. So you have decreased oxygen, perhaps high carbon dioxide levels. This is gonna alter your blood chemistry. So again, in your body, these chemoreceptors, they, they sense the change in, in, in the blood chemistry and then uh, the sympathetic nervous system ends up, well, making your heart beat a little bit faster so you have tachycardia. Okay, so your heart starts beating much faster, your heart is working and then that also, sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system it's gonna increase the heart rate, so increase heart rate, which is tachycardia, and then also you're gonna to start to increase your breathing, so your respirations also go up. Uh, so these are some of the things that we will see this, uh, some of the changes that we'll see uh, that 
some of the signs and symptoms. This is not uh, extensive, but again, we some people end up having it, other people do not have it. So again, this acute respiratory distress, distress syndrome, some people do end up getting it, other people, again, they're completely asymptomatic. Uh, they end up recovering, they don't even know that they had it. So uh, it, it just varies from person to person. Um, so let's talk about now, what are, how, when we get into, when we go to the doctor, when we go to the, the, the hospital, what are the, some of the things that they can do? How can they diagnose? What are some of the tools that they have at their disposal in diagnosing these uh, uh, coronavirus? So we'll start off by looking at that next. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that as the severity of signs and symptoms that I mentioned earlier, as the severity increases, it's going to lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome. And the acute uh, respiratory distress, distress syndrome, as it worsens, it's going to end up leading to systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And this, the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, essentially what that is, is it's an increase in systemic circulation capillary permeability. Okay? So now you have an increase in permeability of the systemic uh, blood vessels, what's going to end up happening? So this increase in capillary permeability of the systemic circulation will result in, um, it's going to result in your blood volume to decrease, okay? Now your blood volume decreases. Now this vasodilation that takes place, it ends up decreasing peripheral resistance. So now you have decreased peripheral resistance and decreased blood volume. What's going to end up happening with that? Well, this ends up leading to decrease in blood pressure. So this decrease in blood pressure, which you call the hypotension, okay, this eventually leads to decrease in perfusion, and this decrease in perfusion to multiple organs leads to multi-system organ failure, okay? Multi-system organ failure. Now, what ends up happening? So, there's not enough blood pressure. So if the pressure is too low, blood can't be sent to, it's, it can't be pushed into the, the cells that make up our organs, such as our liver, such as our kidney, such as the brain, such as the heart. So the organs are not getting enough blood. And again, remember, why do you want blood to get to the organs? For gas exchange to take place. That's the main thing, right? We want gas and we want uh, metabolites to be pushed away. So we're talking about carbon dioxide to be taken away, oxygen to be delivered. Um, aside from carbon dioxide, other uh, waste products that may be present, we want that to be pushed away. So if that's not happening, then we have a problem, okay? And that's what this essentially is. We're not getting this, the pressure's too low. Oxygen is not being able to be, to be pushed into the cells that make up these organs, and the waste products are not, be, are not able to be moved out. So based upon these things, we can start seeing different things, all right? We can start looking at blood work. And these blood works, uh, the, uh, these uh, lab values can tell us which organs are affected. So what are some of these organs that we can look at? Well, we can look at the kidneys. For example, if you look at uh, uh, the kidneys, you'll see elevated BUN, elevated creatinine levels, all right? Um, if you look at the liver, when you start looking at liver, we can start to see elevated levels of AST, we'll see elevated a, um, ALT levels, also you'll see elevated levels of uh, bili. Billy Rubin. Uh, aside from that, we can look at uh, some of these, um, what else can we see? Well, we can look at some of the, inf uh, the inflammation markers. For example, you'll see high level, elevated levels of C-reactive protein, CRP. You'll also see, along with that, the sedimentation rate's gonna go up. Interleukin-6, you will see. You'll see higher levels of interleukin-6. Um, you can see 
LDH levels go up, lactate dehydrogenase. You also see D-dimer levels go up. These will be elevated. Uh, even ferritin levels will also go up. So, well, we, you know, these are some of these inflammatory markers that will go up. These are some of the things you can look at for the, the liver. Um, also, you can look at heart. So, for example, for heart, you'll see elevated levels of uh, CKMB, and also you can see elevated levels of uh, troponin. Right? That, 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 so these things could also be elevated. So these are some of the things that we'll see in terms of blood, so blood tests that, that, uh, that, that we can do. Um, so aside from that, what about, let's kind of actually go back over here. We spoke about some of these things in, in the, uh, earlier, but let's, let me just kind of list it out since we have it over here. So what could we see over here? Well, over here we can see, again, so remember we said we may, now remember, these, some of these initial diagnostics that we can do, it's, they may or they may not be present uh, on the individual. So for example, we may see fever, okay, so an elevated body temperature. There may be a cough that's present, okay? We wanna look at uh, if they're short of breath, uh, do they have to work hard? How hard is their, uh, how much work do they have to put in to breathe? Uh, other times, you know, the other thing that we're starting to see is that some people, they have GI, symptom, uh, GI symptoms, so such as uh, diarrhea, okay, or they may be nauseous and they may vomit. So vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, that could be present also. Um, in addition to that, there may be upper respiratory infection. So, for example, they may have signs and symptoms of a uh, there could be a sore throat, okay? So uh, a sore throat may be present. What else may we see aside from a sore throat? Perhaps a runny nose, okay? Uh, there could be congestion. There may be a headache that, that could be accompanying it. So these may be some of the initial diagnostics. Now, that we've looked at all of this. We've looked at the initial diagnostics and we looked at some of the blood work. What about Imaging, what can we look at for imaging? So for imaging, you know, there's a few different things. One of them is a chest x-ray. And a chest x-ray, again, it's just a very basic picture, two-dimensional picture. And, you know, it could reveal if there's a pneumonia, if there's fluid that's, that may be present. And also, you know, it could show something that's, that we see in, uh, in these viral infections, something called ground glass opacity. Okay. Uh, we may see it, okay? It's not a given, but again, it's, it's possible that it may come up. Ex chest x-rays are not very sensitive to, uh, to observing this. What's more, of an, or, or, you know, what's more sensitive uh, in terms of uh, being able to observe this would be a CAT scan. So CAT scan, they're about, you have 95% sensitivity. Um, and again, they can, we can get a much better picture for ground glass opacity over here. In addition to that, we can also see consolidation that could be taking place, that, that, that's taking place within the alveoli. Um, so a CT is a much more sensitive test in, in, taking a, in getting a better look at what is occurring inside the lungs. Aside from that, an ultrasound could also be used. So in an ultrasound, we may see uh, the pleural line thickening. Also, we may be able to see consolidation uh, take place. Um, there is also something that are called B lines, okay, that may be, that uh, are shown, that we may see in an ultrasound. So chest x-rays, CAT scans, ultrasounds, these may be some of the tools that a physician may use or may not use in terms of um, diagnosing with coronavirus. So yeah, these are uh, some of the things that they have at their disposal, that the healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses have at their disposal. In, coming up with the diagnosis and, and uh, seeing how the progression of the treatment is taking place as it goes by. Uh, so aside from that, what else could we look at? Um, let me come back over here actually. Let me go back to the initial diagnostics for a minute. One thing is, you know, you know I had mentioned about fever. Now, so you guys understand, you know, when you're talking about a fever, um, it's best to get a temperature, you know, now they have these temporal artery scanners, you can use that, or, you know, tympanic membrane. Um, 
if you take a thermometer placed under, underneath the tongue, that's probably the most accurate. Rectal, that's another, again, it's usually used for infants. You're not going to see that taking place in adults. But um, so the oral thermometers, they, uh, they might be, they may be a little bit better. Also, you know, if uh, the ones that I don't like personally, I don't like, are the, the ones that go in the ear, the tympanic membranes. If you don't have a good proper seal, then you, don't, you may end up getting a false reading. You may not get a, an, an accurate reading, which is another reason why I like the ones that you place in your, under your tongue much better. You get a nice tight seal. The thermometer is under the tongue. You're gonna leave it there for a few minutes. You end up getting a pretty accurate reading. Um, same thing with the, the uh, these, uh, laser scanners, you know, if the ambient, if the room temperature is too cool, then again, you're gonna end up losing, it's, it may not be as accurate. So personally, I prefer to use thermometers that go under, under, the, under the tongue. Again, the temporal artery scanners, that they're, they could be fine also if they're properly used. Again, you need to be trained to use those properly. Uh, so yeah, you notice fevers. So when you're looking at a fever, remember what's a fever? Fever is when you have a temperature greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. This is where the, the fever is at. Uh, so yeah, keep that in mind. The other thing that you can, you know, that they can do initially, oh, well, do you have a flu? Is it coronavirus or is it a flu? So sometimes it could be both. So one of the things that you wanna do is you wanna rule out if you do have uh, influenza A or influenza B. So another quick way that they can do this is through, the, the, uh, through it with a swab, a nasopharyngeal swab. So you can take that, test that, you know, you have the results within a few minutes. Uh, more or less the same as how they're testing for corona, uh, coronavirus now. So that nasal pharyngeal swab, if you do test negative for influenza A, perhaps you test positive for influenza B. In that case, hopefully you end up testing negative for coronavirus. But now that doesn't mean that you, know, you will not get coronavirus, you may. All that's saying is, okay, you don't have, at the, point, at the time that the test was conducted, it wasn't sensitive enough to detect any coronavirus at that point. Okay? The test was not sensitive enough to, with, with w the environment that was given with what, with what was present that uh, amongst the sample, it wasn't sensitive to detect any coronavirus particles. That is what that means. That doesn't mean that you don't have it, but it's unlikely that you have it at that point. So, um, yeah, so these are two things that also, again, that can be, you want to rule out for, you want to rule out other uh, viral infections. So again, yeah, the swab, the, you know, when you swab the, the patient, it tends to be rather fast. Again, within minutes, you can get a result. The other thing is, you know, you want to find out in terms of diagnosing, the initial diagnosis, have you been in contact with anybody that, that had tested positive for coronavirus? Ask these questions. You may want to find out about that. If you do know someone that, who may have had coronavirus, and you know, that increases your likelihood of you having coronavirus. Uh, aside from that, again, about travel history, were you, did you do any type of travel? Were you out of the country? Did you go to any hot spots that uh, where, you know, there was a, 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 you know, a very high, uh, an outbreak and an epidemic of coronavirus? So all these will kind of help you come up with a, a good initial diagnosis, which then, again, you can start looking at other things in terms of uh, management and, and treatment. So hopefully this answers some of the things. Now remember, these, all these things that I mentioned, a physician will decide which ones to do. Uh, physicians will take the appropriate course of treatment as well. If any one of you are having any of these symptoms, this is no way to diagnose or treat anybody. This is not the purpose of this. This is just informative uh, for, for you, so you guys can better understand as to what the doctors do. This is not made for uh, a tool for you guys to use to go, and, uh, go out and diagnose other people, or yourselves for that matter. This in no way is comprehensive of everything that ends up uh, transpiring at a hospital, at an emergency room. So with all of this said, now that we understand what the virus is and how it works and how we can get uh, tested and, and possibly treated for it, how do we protect ourselves? What are some of the things that we can do? So as you guys know by now, the one of the things that, that's crucial is just keeping your distance from everybody, so social distancing. When you're out and about, make sure you 
are not in close proximity to other people. Make sure there is a, you know, at least a distance of six feet, two meters apart from, you know, from one another. Um, in addition to that, make sure you cover your faces with the mask when you're in the public. This is being used uh, throughout the world now. Everybody's uh, adhering to this, as I think this is almost a standard at this point. Uh, and again, unfortunately, some countries were very slow at this, while others were much more uh, quicker to, you know, to utilize this measure in terms of just you know, having something over your face, having something over your nose and mouth. Um, so again, make sure at least two meters away, six feet away from, uh, from other individuals when you're in public areas. Uh, best thing to do at this point, if possible, stay at home, stay inside, and try to work as much as you can from, from, uh, from inside if that's an option. Um, the other thing is, again, when you go outside, put a mask on. Make sure you're a couple of meters away from other people, uh, six feet away. In addition to that, wash your hands a lot, okay? So when you start, if you remember back, those uh, the spike proteins that we find on the, on the virus, uh, proteins are sensitive to you know, being broken down rather easily. You know, the handful of things can break it down. Certain chemicals, chemicals that are too basic or too um, alkaline, they will end up denaturing or breaking down that protein. Once that protein is broken down, then it cannot bind to our receptor cells. So that's one of the things that uh, hand washing will do. Will not only will it break up that uh, the protein that you find on the virus, but also, you know, and if you wash your hands, uh, you know, it will wash away the viral particles as well. So um, with that said, again, wash your hand, use soap, rub your hands for a good uh, two minutes or so, not two minutes, I'm sorry, 20 seconds. Uh, so rub your hand with soap for 20 seconds. Uh, after you do that, then make sure you, you rinse the soap off well. Rub your hands again, continue, and make sure you have all the soap uh, washed off. If washing is not an option when you're out and about, then hand sanitizers, they work rather well as well. Make sure they're about 70, 72% alcohol, and that, sh that ends up doing a, a pretty good job in terms of, of uh, denaturing the, the protein. So, okay, you're staying away from people, you're washing, you're sanitizing your hands, you're not touching your eyes, you're not touching your nose when you're out and about. Uh, you're not, in other words, you're not touching your face. What else could you do? Well, if you want, you know, what you want to do with these next three things, essentially, they help boost in your immune system. They help keep your immune system strong. So if your immune system is strong, then hopefully your body has the ability to go in and destroy this virus. So how do you prepare your, your body to go and fight this virus? So one of, the things, one of the things is sleep. Make sure you get enough sleep. Make sure you get at least seven to eight hours of sleep. If you're sleeping between seven and eight hours, then your body is, you're giving your body time to, uh, to build up the, the white blood cells. You're, you're resting yourself, um, and your body's gonna be much more better prepared to go and fight. Uh, compared to if you're staying awake, you're active, you know, you're wasting time, you God knows what. Sleep, get seven to eight hours of sleep a night. Okay, aside from that, give your body proper nutrition. So what are prop what's proper nutrition? Make sure you're eating enough vegetables. Make sure you're eating enough fruits. Meat, you don't need to eat too much of, okay? Especially when you're sick, you don't really need that much meat. Uh, meat, believe it or not, it actually ends up, especially too much meat, will end up, um, it doesn't really help your immune system. It sometimes could have the opposite effect. So too much meat is not really a good thing. Uh, if you get your proteins, from plant-based, uh, from plant sources, that's gonna be much, much, much healthier. So that's much a better source for protein is through uh, plant sources. Uh, so make sure you're eating enough vegetables, make sure you're eating enough fruits, you can have grains also. Give your body what it needs to go and fight. Um, lemons are great, okay, they have lemons and oranges, they have lots of uh, vitamin C in them. Grapes also are great. Blueberries, lots of, uh, and uh, strawberries, lots of antioxidants in them. Uh, and uh, dark green vegetables are great. Dark green, um, leafy greens are great. So chard, uh, kale, spinach, all these are excellent. Root plants are also great, such as uh, beets or uh, carrots. 
they end up being very good also. Uh, aside from that, other roots that are really good, uh, onions are very healthy. Onions, garlic, they have a lot of uh, components that actually end up destroying lots of bacteria and uh, even certain virus in, uh, such as ginger. Ginger is very good for, um, for uh, neutralizing certain viruses that uh, certain, some studies have found. So increasing your intake of, uh, of these roots, these er spices especially such as ginger uh, and, uh, is actually very good for you. Uh, the other thing that I've read about and some people are, are utilizing. So something called uh, black seed oil, nigella, nigella sativia, sativia. This is something that people are using and again, some people swear by it that it, it, it really helps their immune system a lot. You know, you can go ahead and try it if you want to, to use this. You can go ahead and Google and, and research about it. Um, so. If you do, if you're taking these, if you're giving your body all these nutrients, then it has the ingredients that it needs to not only fix and repair itself, but also to go and combat, um, combat against the virus and other pathogens. Um, aside from that, just taking a good multivitamin, that certainly doesn't hurt. Uh, so, you know, of course, you want to make sure if you have other underlying medical conditions, always check with your doctor beforehand, before you go about and taking anything or changing your diet for, for that matter, or taking supplements as well. Make sure you get the consent of, of your physician or your, your healthcare provider. So, um, because sometimes, you know, you may not, uh, doctor may not, if you're taking other medications, you may not be uh, able to take certain vitamins, especially in higher doses. So, uh, that could be, that's a, a very big concern. So make sure you, before you, you make any changes, check with your physician. So you're taking a good, you have a good nutritional intake, you're resting, you're getting about you know, seven to eight hours of sleep, you're washing, you're keeping yourself distant. What's the other thing you can do? Exercise. Exercising, it's, it's great. Exercising stimulates your body to produce more white blood cells, uh, especially activities, heart impact ac activities such as running or lifting weights. These are very, very good, very beneficial. So. Yes, you're being isolated to your homes right now. What can you do? Guys, there's so much you could do at home. You don't really need to go to a gym. You can, if some of you, if you're, you have a home that's, that's large enough, you know, you can walk around in, in, in your home, okay, make a few rounds and uh, going up and down maybe 10 times. That might be enough walking the perimeter of your house. Uh, that could be an option as well. If you have a backyard, then great. You know, you can run sprints uh, in, in your yard. Or again, go online, look for home workouts. I'm sure there's so many popping up these days. I've seen a couple of myself. Um, so, you know, that's option as well. If you have a gym at home, wonderful. Make use of that. But again, doing exercise at, at home, it's also possible. In terms of walking, that's probably the easiest thing that most people can do. So if you can walk for, you know, at least, at least 30 minutes, that's wonderful. Try to aim, aim for 45 minutes, that's, that's best. Um, again, nonstop. Keep walking at a pace that's comfortable for you. This is what you want to do. So 45 minutes you can walk. Uh, don't get lazy. Keep exercising. Keep moving. Your immune system is going to be stronger. You're eating good. Your body's going to be producing and repairing and uh, producing the, the components it needs to, vi uh, to fight the virus and also to, to repair itself. The rest is going to help with that also and the social distancing and the hand sanitizing is going to decrease your risk of exposure. So these are some of the things that you guys can do. I hope this has been helpful, f helpful for you guys. If you have any questions, again, feel free to, to message or email me. Thank you again for watching.